let's go pick it up back in University of Minnesota. You've got the legacy. And I'm guessing at the time, you know, Keyes is really famous for two things in the mid 70s, right? I think by that point, he's probably already published his seven country study. And the, right. the hypothesis now is a very fat centric view of, you know, the, the negative consequences of dietary fat, specifically dietary saturated fat in the American diet, especially as it pertains to ASCVD. And then I suspect the second thing that he's probably still famous for is the starvation experiments um, that were, I'm guessing, done in the 1950s. I mean, these were done on conscientious objectors, so they're probably in the 40s or 50s, right? Yeah, I, I can't exactly date that, but you're exactly right. So those were, I mean, we learned a lot about starvation at that point <laughs> for obvious reasons. We can't do experiments like that before, but we learned a lot about body composition and how the body starves. So those were good, but certainly the legacy was there. And when I got to Minnesota, you know, I sort of bought into the cholesterol and the saturated fat and total fat. And, you know, I, I sort of said, okay, this is what everybody's teaching. And, you know, that's what they, I was forced to learn. That's what they were teaching. Uh, and so I bought into it. But, you know, as I slowly started doing experiments and early in my career, we did a lot of fasting type of experiments with animals to look at composition changes. And I did malnutrition work in, in Northern Africa. And I sort of got into all of that. And I, I, I started realizing, you know, I don't really believe that. And one seminar I will always remember at Minnesota was individual by the name of Fred Kumaro came to Minnesota and gave a seminar about the dangers of cooking oils and specifically trans fats. Mm. And Blackburn and France just ridiculed him, basically said, this is the craziest thing we've ever heard. All these plant oils are great. Uh, and basically, you know, 20 years later, we banned trans fats from foods, literally, as the most dangerous fat that you can encounter. So I, I always remember that just sort of thinking, well, you know, people who ha have bought into this dogma aren't necessarily right, and we need to keep questioning it. <laughs> Speaking of Franz, um, obviously in 1973, he completes a study, the Minnesota coronary experiment. Um, I, I actually find this to be one of the most difficult studies to interpret, not so much the one that he published 16 years later, by the way, in 1989, yeah. but the one that yeah. Chris Ramsden republished just a couple of years ago based on all of the data from Franz's study, plus data he never published. This to me is one of the most complicated stories. And I, I will tell you, I have posed this question to every friend of mine who is more steeped in nutrition than I am. And um, I still don't have a great sense of how to explain these results. So I'll explain it for the, for the listener and the viewer, and I'm curious to your thoughts. So the experiment was done um, in, basically institutionalized patients. So again, maybe not a study that could be done easily again today for ethical reasons, but had the advantage of being so well controlled. You, you basically had patients that were randomized into two groups. Their total energy was identical. Their total split of macronutrients was identical. The only thing that differed was that in one group, it was high saturated fat. And in the other group, it was high polyunsaturated fat. The hypothesis being tested was, is saturated fat intake leading to increased major adverse cardiac events, heart attacks, and strokes? The experiment that completed in, I think it ran, I, I can't remember exactly, I think, I think it ran about five years, in 1973 showed no difference. There was no difference in cardiac events, despite the fact that the group that was on the higher polyunsaturated fat group did indeed have much lower cholesterol levels. Now this was this predated the subfractionation, so they weren't measuring LDL and HDL. They were just measuring total cholesterol. And at the time, there was some correlation between cardiovascular disease and total cholesterol levels. At the extremes, that was certainly true. Again, because I didn't think we'd be talking about this, I don't have the numbers all in my mind, but we'll link to it all. <laughs> But directionally, I believe that the higher PUFA group relative to the saturated fat group was about 30 milligrams per deciliter lower in total cholesterol. And based on everything we know today, we would assume that 
much of that was in LDL cholesterol indeed being lower and non-HDL cholesterol. And yet there was no difference in events. And of course, it's become a very famous and unfortunate story in nutrition research and that Franz chose not to publish it because he didn't like the results. It didn't match his hypothesis, which was that the group on lower saturated fat would have fewer events. Ramsden went and published all of these data plus a whole bunch of sub data, as I said, just a few years ago, I believe in the British Medical Journal, and actually found something that was that threw a wrench in my initial hypothesis. My initial view of the Minnesota coronary experiment was it probably wasn't a long enough intervention. It might be that five years was not long enough to appreciate a difference. And so it was underpowered or too short in a duration to see a benefit if there was a benefit. But in Ramsden's analysis, you actually saw the opposite because he now looked at some subgroups and you actually saw a higher incidence of coronary events in some of the people that were consuming the high polyunsaturated fat diet. And I can't remember what the dominant oil was. I'm blanking on it. I don't remember if it was canola or safflower. I think it was safflower. So how much of that do you remember, Don, from your time there? And can you, can you shed any light on this? Or do you have any thoughts on, you know, how to interpret that experiment? Well, first of all, I am definitely not a lipid expert. So, <laughs> um, I, I, you know, I sort of remember the study, but I can't put any more numbers to it than you did. I actually did some research with Ivan France and Penny Chris Etherton when I was at Minnesota. So I, you know, I sort of was in the loop at the time, but that's been a couple of years ago. Um, yeah, I think if one really looks at the literature on saturated fat and is fair about all of those studies, you find a very mixed bag. The Women's Health Initiative and all of those kinds of things. Uh, and unfortunately, the people who believe the hypothesis have either delayed publishing it or said, well, it couldn't have been wrong and tried to, you know, it could have been wrong and they tried to find all kinds of excuses as opposed to just believing it. Uh, you know, there's an old theory in science that, you know, if the theory is correct, it'll get stronger over time. And if it's not, it gets weaker. And I think one would have to realize that A, the cholesterol theory, the total cholesterol theory has definitely gotten weaker. And the saturated fat hasn't held up very well. Um, you know, we still believe it, but your comment a little bit ago, it's first and foremost calories. If you put excess saturated fat on top of too many calories, that's probably a problem. But if you're at or below your calorie needs, I don't see any data that suggests it is. So, you know, my sort of joke or comment all the time is that if you're committed to being obese, you probably ought to pay attention to the quality of your fats. But if your goal, if your goal is to be lean and healthy, calories is what you're paying attention to and the macro distribution is sort of your personal preference. <laughs>